So uh, I'm pretty confident we'll finish the book today, uh, Why I Believe in God. Um, it's been a bit of a journey through Van Til's life as he talked about his faith in God and how uh, he grew up within a family and a really a, a culture there, a Dutch Reformed culture, where from the very earliest days he was taught to trust in the Lord, to believe in Jesus, and to walk in a world that God has made. And he uh, is writing to his unbelieving friend, whom he uses kind of metaphorically as dwelling in Washington, D.C., where he's out in Indiana somewhere and out in the farm. And uh, he's talking to his worldly sophisticated friend in Washington, D.C., who uh, explains away Van Til's Christian faith by saying that, well, uh, you were raised in that faith, and so it's no wonder that that's what you believe. And, and, uh, but if you, the implication is that if you had studied the worldly philosophers and secularism and, and that sort of thing, you would have abandoned that uh, mythology a long time ago. And Van Til answers that by saying, first of all, you cannot dismiss my experience growing up as a Christian because I can likewise turn your experience around on you and say, well, you're a pagan because you grew up within a, a pagan culture, and a pagan worldview. Uh, your parents didn't lead you to faith in Christ. They didn't read the scriptures to you. They didn't take you to church. You grew up in a secular environment, and so you're the product of your environment. And so let's stop... Uh, casting aspersions on each other because of our upbringing. We are where we are in life. The thing is that within my Christian upbringing, not only was I taught Christian worldview, uh, a world uh, that's ruled by the triune God uh, and created by Him, and to Him all things are subject, uh, but I was also taught about the secular worldview and the different ideas that I would come across in life from the evolutionary scientists, from the um, naturalist uh, 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 psychologist and so forth and so uh, I've become acquainted with these things both in high school and in college and heard the answers from the Christian side and then in seminary and in graduate school I uh, actually sat at the feet of those who taught from a secular worldview and I am very well acquainted with uh, their point of view so it's not as though I'm ignorant of a secular point of view. I've been well trained in it. But that has not dissuaded me from my faith in God. But he asked the, the secularist then to listen to, for the sake of the argument, listen to the Christian worldview. And he, in the process, he says, uh, Christians in the past have compromised their Christian faith by adopting presuppositions of the secular point of view and hope to in some way make it, if you will, easier for them to come into the Christian church by reasoning with them, just saying that if you were a little more consistent in your reasoning, if you were more logical in your uh, work, you would come to see the need for Christianity. But in fact that fails because that viewpoint does not sufficiently account for the noetic effects of sin. In other words, the, it's not only the heart and the passions that are corrupted by sin, but also the mind, the intellect. The mind is hostile to God, and it will refuse anything that uh, points to God uh, and, and reinterpret everything in, in terms of its own autonomous worldview. Man is the measure of all things. And that's the final solution for the secular man. He is trapped in that worldview. He cannot see out of it. That's who he is. It's like the leopard can't change his spots. The, the Ethiopian can't change his skin. Uh, to quote the poem that Trump <laughs> quoted in his campaign, you know, a snake is a snake. And why do you expect a snake to act like a baby? You treat it, you feed it, it's going to bite you. <laughs> it's a snake. That's what it is. And so uh, the, the natural man is corrupted through and through, heart and mind, intellect. And so what needs to happen, we, we can reason with them, we can talk to them about the world from God's perspective and from the viewpoint that God has given to us in His Word, 
not making any compromise with the secular worldview. Uh, but even that, perfectly done, is not going to ultimately change that person. It must be a sovereign, gracious work of God bringing about a new birth, changing the heart, changing the mind, making the heart, heart and mind acceptable to uh, uh, the Word of God, receptive to the Word of God, receiving it in faith, and, and then uh, receiving salvation and a new life. So we preach the Word because that's the avenue through which God is pleased to work His great work of salvation. But simply by preaching the Word doesn't mean that somebody, we're going to persuade somebody or if we make the best argument we can that that's going to win them over. Ultimately, there needs to be this gracious, sovereign work of God in the heart of the individual. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus asked the right question. Well, how can a man be born again? Can he enter back into his mother's womb? Well, obviously, that's a ridiculous notion. No, you can't. But you can't cause yourself to be born again either. That's something that only the Spirit of God can produce within you. Jesus was not saying, Nicodemus, you need to cause yourself to be born again. He can't do that. It's only, as Jesus goes on to say, you must be born of, the, of water and the Spirit. It's the Spirit must work that regeneration within the heart of an individual. And he does that according to God's electing grace. Uh, those whom, as we'll see uh, on Sunday in our sermon, uh, God has compassion on whom he will have compassion. He is sovereign in the, the uh, expression of his uh, mercies and love. And he, he gives that to those whom he chooses out of this world. And in that case... The Spirit of God brings the uh, new life of, and, and the grace of salvation into the lives of those whom God has chosen in advance uh, and brings them to himself. So, Van Til makes his argument, uh, and, and uh, we, we've come along uh, to the conclusion now where uh, Van Til says, uh, and, and I'm going to kind of retrace our steps for just a bit here in this paragraph before we pick up on the other hand there in the middle of the page. Um, in the previous paragraph, Van Til notes that you know there is no unity in your life. You want no God who by his counsel provides for the unity that you need. And so the, the natural man, when he thinks about things, recognizes that there's no real unity to his life. And we're going to talk about this a little bit here, the relationship between the, the plurality of life, the diversity of life, and the need for unity, an all-comprehensive unity that brings everything together. Uh, um, in philosophical terms, this is the problem of the one and the many. Van Til doesn't bring that out in so many words, but this is what he's going to, going to be addressing here as we come to a conclusion. How Christianity alone provides for the unity in the world that we need, so that unity and plurality in the Christian view are equally ultimate because they have their resolution in God himself, who is unity and plurality equally ultimate. He is one God in three persons, each equally and fully God. And so the Trinity is the answer to the great problem of the one and the many in philosophy. You can go all the way back to Aristotle and all the rest of them trying to find uh, an inner unity to all things. Some say it's air, it's water, it's uh, fire, what have you. Some sort of overarching idea uh, that pulls all things together. But as soon as you have one particular idea of something, then the particulars get lost. Uh, I'll just give you a brief example. Let's say you have an idea of a dog, and you describe what is a dog like. Well, a dog has four legs, four paws, um, each ball has like four pads and then a base pad. Uh, there are claws at the end of each pad. Um, there, there's a tail to the dog, uh, a, a nose, and, and uh, it, it's uh, a canine, so its teeth are designed to bite and tear and, and devour meat. Um, uh, it's got ears that are fairly sensitive uh, and, and, and a nose that can smell all kinds of stuff. So you, you got an idea of a dog. And perhaps that idea is in some ways distinguished from a cat or from a horse or from a cow. But the idea of dog 
doesn't really explain my particular dogs. My dog, I've got two of them. One is a tricolor collie with black and white on it, and uh, he, he's 110 pounds. Uh, he answers to the name of Sam, um, and, and these are things that are unique to Sam. My dog Missy is a female, not a male. Uh, she ha has different colors to her, her fur. She's smaller in size. She answers to the name Missy, uh, sometimes, <laughs> when it suits her pleasure. Um, and uh, so they are different, and these two dogs are different from my neighbor's Chihuahua, the other neighbor's German Shepherd, and the Great Dane that lives across the street from the church. Uh, you think uh, Chihuahua on the one hand, Great Dane on the other, um, and the differences in size and all kinds of stuff. There are different particulars, which when I have the idea of dog, it doesn't really account for all these different particulars. And so for the scientist, you can get lost in the plurality, the diversity of life, and say, well, there's a particular dog here, another dog there, and, and so forth. Or you can get, kind of lose everything by just focusing on the big thing. And so, unity and diversity. Um, there are a wide variety of ways of looking at that problem in, in the course of life. Uh, in, the, in the state and the, the government, as Rush Dooney points out, it's a problem between uh, authority for the, the central government and then authority within the, uh, the people of the, the nation. Are we, you know, to... to put it this way, are we Democrats that see everything going up to one central leader? Or are we Republicans that diversify everything and uh, look at all the particulars and say, you know, freedom and independence and individual rights and that sort of thing? And then how do you relate these two? Proper authority and yet diversity of opinion and uh, uh, activities. So th there's politics. And then in the church you have the one body, the church, and yet many members. And we all have different gifts within the church and different uh, responsibilities and so forth. And so there's plurality within the church and yet the great unity. How does all this hold together? Well, uh, Van Til is going to say that the, the unity of all things is found in God himself as the one who by his counsel orders all of life and holds everything together for us. So um, he, he highlights at the end of the paragraph the fact that the secular man, the pagan, really cannot account for unity and diversity. He finds unity in logic, and yet his logic cannot account for the diversity of real things. And so he says, your logic claims to deal with eternal and changeless matters and your facts are wholly changing things. Uh, I read another article about this idea of uh, the one and the many, the philosophical problem. This is not from a Christian source, but from a, another uh, philosophical source. And they said, you talk about the human being, as they begin as a baby, they look much different from when they become an adult or when they become elderly. The body changes significantly along the way. And yet somehow we recognize it's the same person all along the way. I don't look anything like the little baby that I was uh, 66 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, I've changed quite a bit. And I'm not really quite the same as what I was when I was in my 20s. And I'm probably not the same if God should be willing for me to live for uh, a number of more years. I'm not what I'm going to look like in another 20 years or so. And I'm certainly not going to be what I look like when I've passed away from this life and I've been buried into the tomb. Uh, but we recognize that there's some kind of unity there, some personal unity all along the way. So how do we account for that? Well, let's read Van Til here and finally get into him. He says, On the other hand, by my belief in God, I do have unity in my experience. Not, of course, the sort of unity that you want, not a unity that is the result of my own autonomous determination of what is possible, but a unity that is higher than mine and prior to mine. On the basis of God's counsel, 
I can look for facts and find them without destroying them in advance. The secularist destroys facts when he gets to a universal uh, statement about those facts. Uh, the individual aspects get lost in the general statement. The, the general statement of dog gets loses the particulars of Sam, Missy, and uh, the Chihuahua down the street. So those things c get lost. On the basis of, the, of God's counsel, I can be a good physicist, a good biologist, a good psychologist, or a good philosopher. In all these fields, I use my powers of logical arrangement in order to see as much order in God's universe as it may be given a creature to see. The unities or systems that I make are true because they are genuine pointers toward the basic or original unity that is found in the counsel of God. So behind and back of this world in which we live with all of its diversity and all its beauty and complexity and so forth stands the immutable counsel of God. And I can know something of God's counsel and the organization of the world around me in terms of what God has revealed to me. Remember Romans 1 verses 18 and following. Uh, the invisible things of God is divine power and uh, uh, invisible nature have been clearly seen in the world around us. We ha can have some knowledge of the world around us. And that uh, ultimate unity in God and His eternal counsel is that which gives my understanding on an earthly level uh, of the unities of, of the world around me. That's what gives it truth and substance because it connects with God's interpretation of all things. Now, my understanding of the unity of all things is limited because I'm finite and sinful and fallible. And so there, there are glimpses of what I can see of what is true. Think of what Paul said at 1 Corinthians 13. We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face in terms of our, our relationship with God. In the things of this world, we see through things with a certain measure of darkness, cloudedness. We don't see things perfectly, but we see things truly in this world, and there are real systems, real harmonies at work in the world around us because God has put them there for us to see, observe, and base our lives on. The secularist does not have any of that, providing for the unity of his thought. He's got logic sitting up in the air with no connection with the diverse things going on underneath him, uh, and the only way that these connect is because he must borrow from the Christian worldview and in some way uh, recognize the unity that God places within the world and falsely ascribe it to his logic and reasoning and so forth, which really does not connect with the world of particulars. Okay, so, um, next paragraph. Looking about me, I see both order and disorder in every dimension of life. But I look at both of them in the light of the great orderer who is back of them. I need not deny either of them in the interest of optimism or in the interest of pessimism. I see the strong men of biology searching diligently through hill and dale to prove that the creation doctrine is not true with respect to the human body, only to return and admit that the missing link is missing still. Amazing how that is. Uh, what are we? Almost two centuries after Darwin, and uh, still no missing links. I see the strong men of psychology surge deep and far into the subconsciousness, child and animal consciousness, in order to prove that the creation and providence doctrines are not true with respect to the human soul, only to return and admit that the gulf between Human and animal intelligence is as great as ever. And so psychologists with their evolutionary worldview want to account for human consciousness. How is it that we are sentient beings? Well, they try to apply the evolutionary model to that and say, well, uh, sentience has arisen from the lower orders of life. And you know, so uh, the apes have a certain measure of intelligence and we can kind of develop that 
so far, uh, and there are other atoms with other sorts of intelligence. So we can see there's a, a gradual development of the human mind related to the human brain, and uh, so we come to intellect. The problem is that there's a huge gap, a real missing link, big time, between animal intelligence and human intelligence. The ape has a certain measure of intelligence. My dogs have a certain measure of intelligence. But I can't talk to the dogs about theology. <laughs> I can't talk to the apes about science. I can't read them Shakespeare. Uh, it makes no sense to them. They have no interest in it because they don't have the capacity for that. They're not made in the image of God. And so there is a huge missing link even within psychology. He goes on, I see the strong men of logic and scientific methodology search deep into the transcend transcendental for a validity that will not be swept away by the ever-changing tide of the holy new, only to return and say that they can find no bridge from logic to reality or from reality to logic. So here's you know, uh, Plato with uh, the men in the cave and seeing a light outside, however the, the, the analogy developed. Uh, there's no connection between the particulars of human experience and the light of logic or uh, human reasoning or what have you. Um, there's no way in which that connection can be made. Uh, and so, continuing, And yet I find all these, Van Til says in conclusion, though standing on their heads, reporting much that is true. I need only to turn their reports right side up making God, instead of man, the center of it all. And I have a marvelous display of the facts as God has intended, intended me to see them. So, the men of psychology, psycho biology, uh, science, what have you, accumulate a lot of information, but they can't put it all together because their worldview makes a mess of it all. But you can take a lot of their observations and reposition them, as Van Til says, turn them upside down, instead of based on human autonomy, base them upside down on God's sovereignty and His uh, sovereign counsel. And now suddenly begin, things begin to fall into place and make sense. There's unity and there's diversity, and we have a way for accounting for that in a way that's going to be satisfying. And he'll continue with that thought here in just a moment. I kind of like the description that Van Til has here of the, these men of science, he calls them the strong men of biology, strong men, strong men, logic and science and so forth. It's uh, these who present themselves as the heroes of the world, who face the world as it is. They're not going to allow themselves to be um, uh, comforted with these romantic notions of a divine being who's going to come and rescue them at the end of the world or what have you. Uh, they face reality as it is. They're strong and bold and so forth. And so they face their destruction, their demise uh, with the end of life with a stiff upper lip. Well, their whole body's going to be stiff in a moment <laughs> after they die. Um, but these strong men cannot account for the world around them. And so they really only make themselves out to be fools, which is a biblical description of the natural man who says, there is no God. Uh, so, uh, the until urges us then to look to the Christian point of view as that which provides uh, the solution to the, the bedeviling problem of the one and the many within secular philosophy from the times of the Greek philosophers up until the present. In fact, Rush Dooney says that um, in their modern day, uh, people don't even discuss it anymore because it's such an insoluble problem. They just go on without it, try to make do with what they can. So Van Til continues, and if my unity is comprehensive enough to include the efforts of those who reject it, that's the Christian world and life view, the triune God is the sovereign Lord of all. If my unity is comprehensive enough to include the efforts of those who reject it, it is large enough even to include that which those who have been set upright by regeneration cannot see. 
So he's saying that the triune God is the answer not only that includes an explanation for this secular man and his rejection of God, but it also explains those things which we as Christians can't explain. There are things that go beyond us uh, with the limits to our reasoning, with the limits to our experience, our fallibility, and so forth. There are a variety of things that we can't explain, including things in Scripture that we don't always have an answer for. He continues, um, My unity is that of a child who walks with its father through the woods. The child is not afraid because its father knows, because its father knows it all and is capable of handling every situation. So I radically grant that there are some difficulties with respect to belief in God and His revelation in nature and scripture that I cannot solve. In fact, there is mystery in every relationship with respect to every fact that faces me, for the reason that all facts have their final explanation in God, whose thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and whose ways are higher than my ways. And it is, it is exactly that sort of God that I need. Without such a God, without the God of the Bible, the God of authority, the God who is self-contained and therefore incomprehensible to men, there would be no reason in anything. No human being can explain in the sense of seeing through all things. But only he who believes in God has the right to hold that there is an explanation at all. So the pagan can really not provide any explanation for the world around him. Only the Christian can provide it. The Christian can't give it entirely on his own. But his faith is that God himself has the answer to the things that we can't understand or make sense of. I can't make sense of the fact that my computer is connecting me to you <laughs> at this very moment. And I'm sure that there are uh, scientists and engineers and chemists or what have you that have put it all together that knows how it all works. But I'm happy it's there and I make use of it. And uh, I, I leave that explanation to those who made the computers. But more broadly, ultimately, God is the one who's ordered, ordered the world in such a way that at this point in history, we have this capability in front of us. Uh, and so, thanks to God for His mercies in, in allowing that. Okay, so you see, when I was young, I was conditioned on every side. I could not help believing in God. Now that I am older, I can still, uh, excuse me, I still cannot help believing in God. I believe in God now because unless I have him as the all-conditioner, life is chaos. And that is so true. Um, I remember as a student at Pinebrook Junior College studying philosophy and reading all different people and recognizing that following their presuppositions, the only conclusion, the only rational conclusion was suicide. The world didn't make sense. Life did not have any meaning. Why continue like this? Why endure the pain and the suffering and so forth that life brings your way? It is not the final answer suicide? Really, the philosophies of this world lead to death because they are a philosophy of death. It, they develop a culture of death. They are the product of those who are dead in trespasses and sins. And the end of it is death. But in believing in God, we have an answer to all these things. And the soul can rest in that and be at peace. Because we have a God who is infinite in His wisdom, knowledge, power, and so forth. Infinite in His personhood. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is what we need uh, to explain ourselves, our own rationality, and the world around us. So, Van Til concludes this way. Uh, this is the end of the book. I know that it is not in my power to convert you at the end of my argument. I think the argument is sound. I hold that belief in God is not merely as reasonable as other belief. 
it is not a little more probable or infinitely more probable than unbelief. I hold rather that unless you believe in God, that's the God, the Christian faith, you can logically believe in nothing else. I know that you can, you can to your own satisfaction, by the help of the biologists, the psychologists, the logicians, and the Bible critics, reduce everything I have said to the circular meanderings of a hopeless authoritarian. Well, my meanderings have, to be sure, been circular. They have made everything turn on God. So now I shall leave you with him and with his mercy. Um, this brings up a, a critique of Van Til that often comes uh, our way, that your argument is circular. You assume that which is to be proved. You assume the existence of God and therefore see the world in the light of that. Well, you've got to prove the existence of God. Van Til's point is that we cannot prove it in any sort of way that would satisfy secular pagan man because the pagan assumes the opposite. The pagan has his own assumptions which he doesn't disclose. He, he gives the idea that he's neutral and he's just following the facts where they may but he actually has a set of assumptions about the world which he adopts without proof that man is the measure of all things, that uh, uh, man is the, the basis uh, for reason and so forth and on the basis of that, he builds his concept of reality. Well, his assumptions are wrong and destructive. I can't, as it were, prove God by a logical argument and say, with a deduction, God exists. I, I, I'm sorry, i got to get to my father. Be one moment. Rick, if you take over. Okay. All right, do we follow... Follow the argument from Van Til. We understand yeah. that he's. So it's he's really he's really saying that you have to begin with God. Uh, we call Van Til's philosophy um, presuppositional apologetics. You have presuppositions. Everyone has their presuppositions. And the Christian's presupposition is based on the scriptures, which say there is a God and he's made himself known. The world of secularism and unbelief says they, they assume there is no God. You've got to prove him. Hey, Rick. Right. Rick, who, who was it that said, I think a lot of it comes down to that quote, maybe you can remember who said it, about um, understand that you may believe versus believe that you may understand. Oh, yeah. You're talking about Anselm and Abelard. Okay. And, okay. And, I, don't know, I don't know them, but that seems to be the bottom uh, line. Anselm, um, Anselm said, I believe that I may understand. Okay. When Abelard said, I understand that I may believe, I think that was, or I know, I, you know, I know that I may believe. I can't remember the exact quote, but Anselm yeah. was more correct. Okay. That's the, yes. that's the position that Reformed Christianity takes is, I, I take God at his word, mm -hmm. and yeah. there, therefore... God will help me understand. Right. It seems to all come down to a matter of faith. You know, in order to understand, I have to believe. But the, the natural man says, no, you got to prove it to me. I have to, I have to understand in order for me to believe. Right. Yeah, I can't, yeah. can't believe in anything unless I know it. Right. You know, well, like, I just finished a sermon on the Trinity, and... I tell you, talk about a futility when you're trying to preach on something like the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> Not easy to do. I agree. Because you're telling people, I want you to believe in mystery. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. You know, God is yeah. one, and yet he's three. Right. You know, that that's beyond logic. That's beyond our mind's comprehension. Mm -hmm. But I, I try to <laughs> try in my sermon to say, uh, you know, I believe what God says because it is a revelation from Scripture. It's not uh, right there where the Bible just comes right out and says, God is three uh, persons in one being. You know, there, there's no scripture I can refer to, a verse or a paragraph that explains that. It comes out in little bits and pieces through Genesis to Revelation. In some places, a little bit more, like where Paul says at the end of 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, there's a, a more precise statement about the Trinity. Um, or in Matthew, uh, Jesus says, uh, go into all the world and uh, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's another revelation. So, um, so those scriptures can sh uh, show us that God is three, uh, three persons in one being. But we, the Bible no, nowhere says we're going to give you a complete understanding of the Trinity, <laughs> of what the Trinity is, uh, uh, and all that's for God's revelation in eternity. If 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 he even determines to do that. I mean, who can tell God, you know, what he's to do? What, he, you know, how can the cre how can the creature say to the creator, why did you make me like I am? Why am I finite? Why am I, you know, so. I wanted to say that the presupposition apologists are a little bit different than the recovery model from addiction and the recovery model for mental health. The recovery model for addiction says because of your sin, just do it anyway. Go to church, believe in God, and do it because your sin is corrupting you. And mental health would say take your medicine, go to therapy, and there's a better chance you'll make it. But the presupposition uh, apologetics is much more nurturing and uh, intimate, I would say, and allows you to transition much nice, nicer. Nice there. Yeah, you have two two models there, uh, um, the Christian model, which doesn't say you know don't take your medicine. It, it's you know fine to take your medicine to to help you with things, but um, ultimately, as you say, there's a, a view of human nature that it's sinful. And it needs the remedy of God's word. It needs the grace of the gospel. It needs a relationship with God through Christ in order to, to bring about change. And it also needs the fellowship of the saints, uh, the encouragements that the body of Christ provide to help you along the way. Um, the, the secularist strips away all that. You, know, you really don't need all that stuff. Come to therapy. Um, take your medicine. And um, you know, share with each other what your experience is. And you know, maybe we can help you improve some things. And in the meantime, they put a label on you. You know, you're a schizophrenic. You're, uh, you've got Asperger's syndrome. You, you are uh, whatever it is, a drug addict. And that's it for life. You can't escape that label. It's like Donald Trump saying that Jeb Bush is a uh, low energy Bush. <laughs> and you know, the label stuck. And he, he, he couldn't get out of it. And, and that's kind of what happens in psychology. That they, they put a label on people, and, and that's who they are. And you're always forever in that camp. Uh, within Christian faith, there is the opportunity for um, redemption, for salvation, deliverance from sin. Uh, I, I've told this before. Jay Adams used to say, um, one is a door, not a door. Mm -hmm. When it's a jar, <laughs> it, it, 
God brings about a change in the hearts of our lives. You once were, uh, as Paul would say, you once were uh, disobedient to parents and, and adulterers and murderers and, and, and thieves and so forth. But now in Christ, you've been made new. And so there's the opportunity for change, real lasting change, genuine change. Not that we, we become perfect by any means, but there's a significant change in our lives. And it, it takes time for that to work itself out, but uh, it's there. Yeah, everything is, um, everything is corrupted by sin. From the very creation, our very health, our minds, everything is corrupted by sin since the fall. Yeah. And so, so it's that the secularists cannot say that, well, the answer to sin is Christ. That there's another answer, and, and so as, as believers, we we can trust that the answer is Christ because He's the answer to sin. He's conquered sin, so therefore He's conquered all of our infirmities, and we can trust in Him for the change that's necessary. Uh, he He can heal um, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, whatever. whatever. Um, but if you take Christ out of the picture, you're you're stuck with <laughs> you're stuck with what the world only the world can offer. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Who wants who wants to live with the uh, uh, with the view that all of life is chaos and that there's no no making sense of this world and that's a better it's better to take your life than to continue to live your life. That's craziness. Yeah. The, the the one and the many helps with the uh, seems to help with the addiction and the mental health and because well I could say well I could label myself as a baby that would have been longer ago than I want to admit <laughs> and then adolescent a young man those things aren't true anymore <laughs> however as time goes on they they those labels have changed so even even whatever addiction or whatever problem. That can change as well, but then again, what pulls it together? God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. So, where is this sal we, we get into salvation? How how does a person that all the people that have risen above mental health and addictions and all these different things? Um, they didn't do it for themselves. They didn't heal themselves. They may some may think they did, but that's impossible. You can't heal a, a sick person. Can't heal a sick person. It's, this doesn't make you know. It, it, it goes to the one of the many as people change. What's the what's the what changes people? It's it's absolutely the Holy Spirit. It's salvation through Christ. It's the Father who sent His Son. All, all it's God as a whole. It's the only thing that makes any any sense. Otherwise, we'd all still be, I guess, like the apes. We wouldn't grow much past an infant. It would seem. Uh, that's my philosophy for the day. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. It's, it's... Rich, can you remember Anselm and Abelard had uh, back in the Middle Ages? <laughs> there was a debate about, I know that I may believe or I believe that I may know. I think that's Anselm and Abelard. Um, Mike was bringing up up that historical debate and I, I believe it was Anselm that said I believe that I may know and Abelard said the opposite I don't remember that debate so uh, but I, I do think that, that it would have been Anselm that would say I believe in order that I may know um, I think he had uh, yeah. I could I know I, I have a church history book where I could if I could find it right now <laughs> I could make that clear, but I'm pretty sure that that's what um, what the debate was between Anselm and Abelard. I thought it would be on yeah, it was, uh, how carefully Occam's razor could shave close to the skin. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember that debate. It's been a long time. and well, That's how I got us into the Trinity and so forth, because we, we could never know the Trinity 
fully, but we do believe that there God is Trinity, God is three. Right. What, which one was right again? Anselm. And what did he say? Compared. I believe that I may know. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's a good one. I have to mm. look yeah, that up. I'll, remember. Later, that. later today, I'll I'll find my history. Yeah. Church this the other one must have been based on Saint Thomas Aquinas, who who could prove the existence of God, a God, but takes the one touch of God to give you faith. So, I know that I may believe. So, knowing is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what my, my bringing up, you know, bringing, brought up as a Catholic, I believe. But to put the icing on the cake, the preachings of um, St. Thomas Aquinas showed step by step that you can know that there is a God, a creator, and takes you through it step by step. And that's, that put the icing on the cake for me. Mm -hmm. So how do we know? How can we come to that conclusion when our very thoughts are corrupted by sin? Well, it's true, but if you take th this approach I went through it because I had to take a course in it. So it was like, what is reality? And then what are the other philosophers saying about reality and this and that? What you see is what you see? Or is it a fan, a fantasy that is not really true, which some of them are? Right. I mean, yeah. reality isn't reality. Yeah. I agree with you that we, we can know, mm -hmm. but that comes from the work of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes. It's not something yeah, it's, that's it's, it's, coming right out of our, our ourselves. Well, because well, otherwise we were never corrupted. Why do we need a savior? Well, no. It's definitely, it helps me, put it that way. Mm -hmm. And it put the icing on the cake, you know, uh, being a believer to begin with, mm -hmm. uh, that there was never any question, and this just said, okay, I can, I can find, you know, the uncaused cause. You can go back to the beginning of time and say, well, okay, what was the first inkling of anything on earth? I mean, the first man, the first woman, were they fully formed? Well, I mean, I believe they were fully formed. And just like all the animals, an alligator was an alligator, it's still an alligator, and still looks like an alligator. Uh, and some of these other swamp beings and whatever, they were fully formed. And it's just like God put everything in order and then said, go. Just like you turn on the switch for, uh, he turned on creation, you know, in his seven days, six days, and then rested one. So, um, oh, well, I just wanted to mention that series that I was watching was a four-part series. First two parts were fine. The third part also gets into Seven Day Adventists. They said, "You guys that are that are uh, uh, having your worship on Sunday are all following the Catholic Catholic tradition, which was it, it, not correct." No. So get out of it and come to the Seventh Day Adventist. But they didn't really say that. It, 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 it was very quietly it snuck in. Um, what, that, Maybe that, they're saying that the Protestants are following the Catholics in the right. tradition of Sunday being the day of worship rather than Saturday, and right. they are the true ones that hold to a Saturday form of worship. And mm -hmm. So that's how Protestants are following Catholics, and that and, and that is an attempt to say, you know, you, you're you're going the wrong way because you're following the Roman Catholics. At least the Protestants would not want to be following the Catholics on something and some things and. Uh, so it's an attempt to try to make a division, but we, we would agree with the Catholics that, that you know, Sunday's the Lord's Day, is a day of worship, a day of rest, set aside to um, rejoicing in our risen Savior. Um, We're also following the apostles. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, they, they say that. The apostles, Paul says it, right? On the yeah. Lord's Day. Yeah. 
Okay, I found in the book, my church history book, Christianity Through the Centuries by Earl Cairns, which was my church history book in college. And uh, on page 255, he has Anselm from 1033 to 1109, was born in northern Italy, received his education at the Abbey of Beck, and he was elected as prior of the Abbey. He held that position until he became Archbishop of Canterbury in 1093. Anselm's idea of the relationship of reason and faith was summed up in the statement, Credo ut intelligum, I believe in order that I may know. And then a native of Brittany, Abelard, who lived from 1079 to 1142, became famous for his intellectual ability. He was vain and critical of others to such an extent that he often alienated his friends. In 1115, he became the can a canon of Notre Dame. Um, anyway, in contrast to Augustine and Anselm, he held to the idea of an intelligo at credum, I know in order that I may believe. So, is that, so I, my, I have my book right. <laughs> is that Peter Abelard or just St. Abelard? Or? I think it was Peter Abelard. It, it strikes me. That, um, I, I, I don't know Anselm's first name, if he had one. Wouldn't it, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better to say I have faith that I may believe? That's what Anselm essentially is saying. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, good. Okay, I'm getting it then. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I did my own research. Primary. Faith must be primary and must be a foundation for knowledge. Yeah. That was the essential position of Augustine held some centuries before. And we we know that we in Reformed Christianity uh, derive a lot of our teaching from Augustine. Even before Calvin, Augustine believed many of the things that Calvin taught. I have a, an extended quote from St. Anselm, which uh, gets to the point. It says, For I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe, that unless I believe... I shall not understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I was thinking of when I think that's what I was thinking of when at the conclusion of, of the the until section that we covered today, yeah. that the difference between the believer and the and the secularist that the secularist tries to say, well, we need to understand everything in order to have faith mm -hmm. versus the believer who believes uh, can't understand unless he believes. <laughs> so there's a big yeah, difference there. The secularist was born in Missouri, the show me state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Anselm wrote a very famous work, Cor Deus Homo, Why God Became Man. Yeah. And so he's known for that too, not just his position on, I believe that I may know. Mm -hmm. Ridge, back to the thing you were saying about the missing link. I wonder if uh, addicts and angels are the missing link. Angels will be to God's intelligence, and addicts will be to like an animalistic intelligence. You're thinking about the great chain of being, <laughs> and that's not a, a, a Christian concept. There, there, there's the idea that chain of being that all is one and so God kind of unfolds in various permutations over the course of existence so there's God angels demons uh, men animals plants rocks so forth and they, they all have kind of lower degrees of God and so um, there are these links along the way to God and you ascend along this chain of being to rise up to the level of God. Um, 
Yeah, the missing link refers to a, a, a intermediary form of animal between an ape and a human, such that um, perhaps it's an animal that stands upright and and can do basic math but can't do calculus. <laughs> yeah, it's just something intermediate. Uh, so evolution considers that there's a gradual evolving of beings over time, uh, over vast amounts of time, through chance interactions and random events. That suddenly a frog decides it wants to sing an aria and <laughs> it just starts singing. Yeah, it, it's just a, a, a gradual development and, and there's just not that, that gradualness between. There are huge leaps between the animal world and the human world. Uh, animal, animal beings, consciousness, and human beings in consciousness. It's just an insurmountable distance between the two. And so what scientists typically do is say, well, um, yeah, the evol evolution has these unexplained jumps, <laughs> they, you know, and so they just kind of make it up, you know. Well, there's a jump, there's a leap, um, th there's a sudden explosion and change, and all of a sudden uh, uh, something is born with the ability to stand upright and use its hands as instruments and that sort of thing. Um, so, Would you say there's a leap? From man to God, like unexplainable amount of intelligence. Yeah, the, the, there's a. Van Til would talk about the creator creature relation and distinction. God, we, we are not God. We don't participate in the divine being. We have created beings. We are finite beings. We will always be created finite beings subject to God. We don't ascend back into divine nature in some way, as uh, many teach. Um, we remain creatures. Now, we're fallen in sin, redeemed in Christ, we're glorified. We are deified in the sense that we uh, are perfected in holiness and righteousness and truth. And so we, we share in uh, some of the divine attributes of God, but we do so still on a creaturely level. Not an imperfect level, a creaturely level, uh, in that state of perfection. But there, there is just a, there's a gap that cannot be surmounted between the infinite God and the finite creature, the eternal God and the temporal creature. There's just, God is different from us, and He will always be distinct and different from us because of His nature. He ever existed. We had a beginning that cannot be changed. So we will always be creatures made by God, subject to His dominion, uh, living in the world that He has created and controls. God is the only thing that God can't create because He would have to be eternal. So you, there can't be a beginning of something that's eternal. Where God created us, we have maybe we can have an eternal future, but certainly we had a beginning. So there's no, there can't possibly be, we can't evolve to God or anything like that. It wouldn't make any, this wouldn't make any sense, I think. Yeah, that, well, I, was, I was thinking about um, praying for wisdom and the amazing things that can ensue when you have a blessing of godly wisdom. And that amazes me and I wouldn't know what else sometimes that ought to be a, an object of our prayers and the desire of our hearts to grow in wisdom um, and wisdom comes from the fear of God um, remember what Proverbs says here somewhere around here I've got a Bible I'm sure <laughs> the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom right um, so uh, with that statement you see the presupposition of the fear of God as a foundation for wisdom, except you have a fear of God, reverence for God, uh, a knowledge of who God is, and a desire to obey Him. Only on that foundation can you begin to experience true wisdom. Now, you could be a smart person in the world, and you can be uh, 
this is a big new Brzezinski or uh, a George Schultz or some other worldly sophisticate who, uh, now I, I don't know about George Schultz and his beliefs at all, but um, you can be a worldly sophisticate in touch with the way things, things are in the world, but you're not wise truly in the things that matter. Um, Henry Kissinger might, might be wise in the ways of the world and be able to talk about geopolitics and decisions that governments make and that sort of thing. But he's not wise from a Christian point of view. We can learn from uh, Kissinger, Brzezinski, George Schultz, or what have you. But um, wisdom is founded on the fear of God. And so that is the fundamental assumption, the presupposition for understanding properly the world that's around us. Uh, so uh, we should be praying for wisdom, um, and we're encouraged to do so. Um, so I, I've been doing that for a long time, praying for wisdom and knowledge, because I always think about Solomon. And yeah, right. yeah. But the but, but only thing I found, I, I don't think I've gained in great wisdom and knowledge, but I think I've just seen how stupid I used to be. <laughs> you know, you know, pretty much. You know, and and then all of a sudden, uh, it, it, by having that that stuff, that stupid stuff eliminated, it, it, the the T-shirt qualifies. I'm surrounded by stupid people. You know, it's like <laughs> you really. <laughs> this. I think I'm just more and more in tune with the stupidity in the world, the lack of God, yeah. and it goes right back to fear in God. It, yeah. It's it's the lack of God, yeah. of godliness of, of yeah. learning about God, that is is the problem. Is it, it, it's you know better watch out what we pray for, but I continue to pray for it. it it's a uh, it's good. It, it's a great thing to pray for. Conversely, the fool in his heart says there is no God. So there is the alternative presupposition: fear of God, or there is no God. And all pagans, all unbelievers, all those who are of this world believe at heart that there is no God. Now, underneath it, God has revealed himself to them. There's no way that they can escape it. They know deep down within them that God exists and they are accountable to them, but they suppress that knowledge with the assumption there is no God. There's no fear of God in their eyes. And so they become foolish and they give their lives over to foolish things. Um, a pursuit of money, fame, power, influence, what have you. Um, they're pursuing these things, but they're not pursuing the kinds of things that God calls us to. A, a walk with Him, a fellowship with Him, knowing Him more and more each day, and being a blessing to those who are around us, using the gifts that God's given us to that end. I wonder if He blessed those men with wisdom to show us how foolish they were. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you feel like they've advanced in their own mind, but here we are worshiping God and believing in Him and fearing Him and everything, and they've come up with all these rational ideas. And to us, that kind of looks like, what are you doing? You know, like, it seems like in some ways that's, He has a sense of humor. Well, you kind of get that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul talks about um, preaching of the gospel. And there's not many wise, not many mighty that come into the church. God has been pleased to um, show mercy to those who are weak and foolish in the world's eyes to shame the wise, to, to put them to shame uh, and, and making foolish the wisdom of the world. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. That's all unbelievers. They are perishing. It's folly to them. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. There it is. That's the, you know, the, the, the Henry Kissingers of this world, if I can make him as a model in that way, or the, the Plato's or the Aristotle's um, of this world. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And Paul goes on, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Plato didn't know him. Aristotle didn't know him. Plotinus, uh, all the Greek philosophers, so forth. I don't know about Kissinger. I don't know where he's at spiritually, but let's say he's an unbeliever as well, worldly sophisticated. Um, I think he was Jewish. Probably, yeah. Uh, he's still alive, I believe. He's like 100 years old or so, something like that. But anyway, yeah, so and I think yeah, he published no. a book recently too, which was highly regarded. But mm -hmm. at any rate, um, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Aristotle does not reason to God, cannot reason to God. The world did not know, uh, did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Uh, we could go on, read through the balance of the chapter. Um, in fact, I'll do that for just a little bit. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. The sophisticated views of the world that come across on CNN and MSNBC, uh, th that sort of thing. Uh, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, okay? The weak, poor Christians living in the slums and, the, and that sort of thing, these are the, the ones that God has used to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus. Okay, not because of ourselves, not by our reasoning or our power or anything like that, not by our works or our thinking. Because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, not in human reasoning. So, uh, much to your point there, Justin, God is pleased to use the foolishness of this world, weak Christians, ordinary Christians who seek to live a godly life in this world to shame the wise. So, like, you have it on display today in the school board meetings where you might have Christian people who come before the public schools and say, look, you're teaching our children pornography. You're reading, you're having them read from your library and in school textbooks all this stuff that celebrates homosexuality and transgender stuff, and this is corrupt. Well, the worldly wise sitting on the school board just dismisses that. The, the educators in the uh, Federal uh, Department of Education just said, we know better. You don't know what you should be teaching your children. You should stay out of this business. This is our realm of responsibility. In other words, we're the wise ones. We're the sophisticated ones. We understand. And so, therefore, you know, listen to us. Well, seems to me that God is showing the foolishness of those things through his weak people who stand up, strengthened by God's word, and say, the emperor has no clothes. Um, th this is an evil thing. Um, anyway. That is the gravamon of my disposition. And it must enrage them, you know, because what can you do, you know? as a ungodly person, you really have no power, you know? You have just your own God-given intellect and what's that throw to, you know? It doesn't bounce off of anything. It kind of just 
meanders and turns stagnant. But the, I find one thing, it's very humiliating, humbling for me. It's like the, the more I learn, the less I know. It's like, oh, I hear this. I didn't know it. Man, I didn't. This when I think, ah, man, I don't know anything. <laughs> it's great. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's one thing you, can't, you can never stop learning and growing. And there's so much that we forget. We learn it, and then it, it, we forget over time, and we got to go back over it. Like I, I'm reading a book by Alex Jones called The Great Reset. <laughs> I need a great reset of my mind. <laughs> mm. So I read through it. I got you know, maybe, I forget, how 150-some pages into the book or so, but I forgot to put the bookmark in where I was at, and I, I marked it to an earlier spot because I was quoting from it for a sermon or one of our Bible studies. I forget what it was, but anyway... Um, so I get back, I open the book now after a couple of weeks of looking at it, and I'm at a bit about page 128, and I'm thinking, this stuff's looking familiar. <laughs> and I'm reading through it, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think I read through this before. And it's just like, it was just a few weeks ago, but... Yep. How, how many times in Scripture have you read something and then then heard it somewhere in a sermon or something? That happens to me on Sundays a lot. Like, And then, and then I read it again, I'm like... I got so much out of it the last time, but it means something even more to me now. Yeah, you know, that's true. this the scripture hasn't changed at all, but maybe something to me has changed. That right. and the next time I hear it, I'm hearing a new. Yeah, it just never, it, it never stops. I, I think even if someone were able to know the whole Bible, memorize the whole thing, and learn it, as soon as they start over again, it's going to be a whole new thing to them because they'll have <laughs> they'll have changed their their heart will have changed it's more. The scripture is the mind of God. Yeah. It's, it's turning into a sage, Chuck. You have all these treasures. You have to go out into the world and bless the non-believers or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I feel like I'm turning into. So when I when I treasure a part of scripture, I'll you know I'm I'm not fluent in the Bible, but I feel like when I'm reading it, it's you know, the Holy Spirit is in changing things around and stuff. But, you know, if you treasure something and you can give it to somebody, I would say that would be a sage type of person. Yeah, well, we have something to give when we're on, when we're, when we're, we can certainly witness to people and, um, and show them where, you know, where we got our enlightenment or whatever. <laughs> Yep. For me to live is Christ. That's the summation that's of life. Paul, raise that Paul. That's the that's Apostle that. Paul in Philippians chapter 1. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was thinking, in my introductory comments, I wanted to quote some scriptures, and I've neglected to do that. But in Ephesians 1, you know, talking about unity and the unity of all things, Paul says that um, God lavished uh, the riches of his grace on us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So Christ is the organizing principle of all things. And uh, through his work of redemption, we are being reunited to him and conformed to him. And... Uh, that's where unity is coalescing around him. Um, let's see. Did you say that's chapter 1, Rich? Yeah, that's chapter 1, verse... Uh, ultimately, it's verse 10. Uniting all things in him. I see it. Yeah, he speaks of us and him, and he and us, and uh, that we would, his church, he will be married to his church. So we will be. That, but I think that's our greatest longing, is to be one with Christ, to be united with our Creator. Yeah. Makes everything in the world pale by comparison. 
right. I mean, and we were talking about wisdom a moment ago. Paul in Colossians chapter 2 speaks about Christ as being, well, as he did in 1 Corinthians 1 we read earlier, but in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Um, so here's that, you know, the reverence of God is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, knowing Christ is going to be the place where uh, you will find wisdom. So in order for you to understand the world around you, you must see it through Jesus Christ, um, the mediator between us and God. Oh, well, there's so much more could be done. Now you're going to have to watch out because I got the St. Ignatius Press here. and <laughs> I got opportunities to get all kinds of interesting books and stuff from Roman Catholic point of view so mm. maybe Ooh. picking up a book or two I'm not without resources in that way but that's the that, that that's the truth yeah well you guys are not without resources yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. and knowledge yeah <laughs> I think it's important that if we have, oh, I'm sorry. The New Jerome Biblical Commentary. This is a Roman commentary. commentary on the Bible all the way through. And, uh, okay. that. And I got a bunch of other stuff. I don't